What is going on everyone? Welcome back to another Swift tutorial. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. Instead of building an app or digging into some UI library, we're going to be learning about result objects. So I've come to realize that a lot of people are not familiar with what this is, but it's actually super useful, uh, pretty easy to understand and wrap your mind around. And I think uh, a big problem is just exposure. So I wanted to talk about what this is, how to use it, how to leverage it so you have to write less code in today's video. So that said, we're going to be looking at a playground and a actual practical application of this. So hit that like button down below as usual for the YouTube algorithm. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Hit subscribe. Let's dig it. Quick pause before we get into the video. If you haven't seen it already, I am hard at work putting together iosacademy.io a community where all of us iOS engineers can come together, learn how to build some of the top apps like Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, in addition to interview prep to land some of these iOS roles at top tech companies. So if you're interested in the free and premium content to come, head on over to iosacademy.io and enter your email address in the waitlist form and you will be notified as content becomes available. That said, let's get into the video. Let's get started by creating a Swift playground. We're gonna stick with a blank playground and let's call this uh, results.playground. And once Xcode decides to load, let's jump right in. So hopefully, okay, there it goes. Let's expand this window to give ourselves a little more room to work and let's start talking about results. So a result is actually just a type in the Swift language that lets you encapsulate either a value or a error depending on if the result is a success result or a failure. So instead of talking through theory, let me create a result value here, a property, and let's actually look at an example. So as I mentioned, a result encapsulates two things, uh, a value or an error. So the value could be any type that you want to get returned in the success case. So let's say string. And the error is something that conforms to the error protocol. So here I've defined that this result is of this type. And if we try to assign this, you can actually assign it to one of two things. One would be the success case and the other is a failure case. Now looking at this, you notice that in the success case, it tells us it wants a string. And the reason it wants a string is because we've said string. And in the failure case, we need to supply an error. So let's actually look at this with the success case. So let's say some string in there. And let's also look at this in the error case, which is failure and we can supply an error, but instead of supplying error directly, what we actually need to do is create our own set of errors. And the simplest way to do that is by creating an enumeration. So an enum, let's call it my error. It conforms to error. And in here we can put our cases. So let's say uh, something invalid, some other error, and in here now for the failure case, we can say this dot one of our errors. And you'll notice that everything turns to the proper uh, token color because we are basically saying the result here is a failure of this error type. And it's in the success case, uh, we're passing the string back. So essentially a result is a cleaner way to handle a success and failure case. So before results used to exist in Swift, you would often find people doing things such as the following. So let's say we had a function uh, called do something and it tried to do something and gave you a completion handler back. And essentially the two parameters coming back would be a Boolean as in, did it succeed? And let's say some data like so. So let's say we wanted to do something in here. The caller would do something along the lines of do something uh, success comma data in, and then you'd say, okay, if success, we succeeded. Otherwise, 
we didn't succeed. And because the data is optional, you would have to do guardlet result data equals data. So the, the, the point I want to get across here is using this success object, it drastically simplifies the boilerplate code that you need to write. And let's actually update this to use the results, and you'll see what I mean. And then we'll also jump into an Xcode project to see a real world application of this. So instead of having uh, a Boolean and data, the result already uh, can represent success and failure. So we're going to say that this instead returns a result with data, or optionally, uh, we're going to say my error, like so. And in the calling side, we can simply say this result in. And in here, we can actually switch on results. So in the success case, we know we're going to have data. And this data will not be optional because the caller in here called success. Or we're going to have the failure case. And we know there's going to be an error. So we're going to have error here. Now notice that success or failure are mutually exclusive. That's the reason we don't have to do something like uh, data optional or error optional, because it's only one or the other. So the optionality is handled by the construct of our results. So you can see in here, now we can simply use our data, or we can uh, handle the error accordingly. So it severely decreased the amount of complexity in here. And to be frank, it's also more readable. It just makes more sense from a layman's English standpoint where if a successful result came back, here's the success uh, value. Or if an error came back, here's the error. So that all said, let's actually create a real Xcode project. And we're going to create a function that you would see in a real world application, something that I myself would add pretty often. So we're going to call this project example project. I'll stick it on my desktop and we'll quickly put a real world application uh, together for this result object. So in a real application, oftentimes you need to call an API to get some data from some remote server. So sometimes uh, what people will do is they'll create a class called API caller. And in here, I'm just going to create a static let shared property, which just returns an instance of the class like so. And let's say there's a function on here, which is going to perform a uh, get request or some type of network call. So we'll say func fetch with URL, which will be a string in a completion handler. And we're going to make it escaping. And this completion handler is going to return a result data. And we're going to create our own error in a second, but let's just call this error for now. And this whole thing returns void. And let's create our function body. So let's say once our view controller loaded, we wanted to fetch some data from some random API. So what we would say is uh, API caller dot shared. And we're going to call this fetch function. Let's pass in a dummy URL. So let's say uh, API dot Google dot com slash something. And in the completion, we have nothing more than a result, it's a single thing. And in here, like we saw, we can switch on result. Let's try that one more time. Should auto complete the whole body, but I guess not. And we're going to have a success in here, which will be our data. And we're going to also have a failure case, which will be our error. But let's actually implement this because this is where things get a little more interesting. Uh, we can ignore these warnings. It's just saying that we're not doing anything with the variables coming into our success and failure case. But to actually make an API call, it looks something like this. I'm going to say task is a URL session. 
dot data URL session. I believe shared actually. There it is. URL session dot shared data task with URL with a completion block. And we're going to create a URL with a string with the parameter URL. And then this completion block will have data, a response, an error. So data, response, and error in here. And we're going to say task.resume to actually kick off the task. Now, you could hand back the all of these parameters to the caller function. But what's nice about this result use case here is the caller doesn't really care what's in the response, what's in the error, what's in the data. All it wants back is the data if it succeeded or an error if it didn't succeed. So what I would do in here, I would say guard let data equals data. Otherwise, we want to cancel out of it. So we are going to essentially call the completion block. And in here, we can say failure and pass in an error. So let's create our own enum in here called my error, which is an error. And let's call this failed to fetch. Put this in the error type. And we can say in here, failed to fetch. And let's say we get past this uh, guard let for the data. We can say um, if error equals nil, we can continue and we can basically call the completion handler with success like so and pass in this data from up here. Or we could basically say else we want to call completion again with failure and pass in uh, this error. Now, of course, we can have as many errors that we, as we want to be specific. I just added one for the sake of being lazy in this example. But the point is that I want to get across is the call site is very minimal and we've obfuscated all of this handling of a completion to this inner function that does the fetch. So any anywhere in your app that you need to make an API call, all you need to worry about is success and failure. You don't need to worry about doing this data check and all this error checking and handling business that we got going on in here. So it greatly reduces the complexity of your call site code. Um, the other thing I'll mention before wrapping up is a result can have absolutely any kind of value in here. What you can actually also do is put a result into a results result. So this can get a little wonky once you start wrapping your mind around it, but Let's say you wanted to have uh, outer results, so this whole thing, let's set your API call, and then you, al you also want to have another inner result for some secondary tasks to presume, uh, presumably do after you fetch the data. This is totally valid also. Um, this is a little less common to see in practice in larger projects just because it just makes things complicated and people don't like doing it this way because it becomes hard to read. But I just want to mention it's definitely an option if you were thinking about doing it. So that said, that's actually all I had for you guys today. Definitely a different video from what I've been doing recently where we've been building apps and looking at UI stuff, but a super important topic nonetheless. Thanks for watching. If you haven't smashed that like button already down below, please make sure to do so for the YouTube algorithm. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button while you're at it. Comment down below if you have any questions. I try to reply to every single comment within a day or two, and I'll catch you in the next video.